Hey Beer Geeks and welcome back to Beer School! I know it's been a really long time since we did one of these episodes where we drill down into one of the ingredients or main processes in making craft beer, but today we're really excited to be in Suffolk at Munton's Maltings. It's one of the best maltings in the UK and they make some incredible ingredients, not just for brewers, but also for all kinds of ingredients and all kinds of products that you'd never ever expected. But today we're going to drill down into not only how malt's made, but how it's used by brewers to make the amazing flavours that we see today in modern brewing. This is Beer School and this is Malt. When was the last time you got excited about the malt in your beer? I'd wager never. Hops take the headlines, yeast gets the Unsung Hero Award and malt, well it's lucky to get a mention in the thank you speech. But when there are only four ingredients in something, every single one of them is worthy of attention. In beer, malt adds aroma, flavour, body, it gives it colour and helps retain head, and of course it provides the sugar that's turned into alcohol. So how it's made and used is key to understanding our favourite drink. Brewing starts by basically making a porridge with malt and warm water, which creates the sugary liquid that we ferment. There's more on that later, but first, what is malt? Well in most cases it's barley that's gone through a very specific process, releasing vital enzymes and adding colour. All this happens at a maltings like Muntins in Suffolk, one of the world's leading malt makers. We headed there to get a tour and talk to Fabian Clark, Muntins technical brewer who tests the malt, tries new products and advises brewers on how to get the best from their product. So what does a brewer need to get a great beer and how is it made that way? As we find out, just be warned, I look ridiculous in a hairnet. So it'll be varying from uh, starch and extract, so the amount of sugars potent, uh, that will be then used in brewing to create alcohol, but also nitrogen for head retention and body, and also uh, not too much nitrogen to make sure that the haze in the product is stable. And why is barley in particular used over different grains? So there's a few reasons. Traditionally, barley has not been usable for bread making. So things like wheat and spelt and rye have been a lot more popular for bread because there's no husk, so it's easy to make bread out of it. In comparison, barley is a husk on the outside, which is, isn't great to chew. So the second reason is that husk helps brewing a lot because it of course forms a, a bed in the lab's turn. And so yeah, it almost kind of self filters yeah, it. Basically, itself. filters itself. And adding to that, barley has a very nice sort of starch to nitrogen protein um, balance that is just a lot more beneficial to brewing in comparison mm. to wheat or spelt. Getting barley in peak condition starts by being harvested and delivered by farmers daily. The first step is to check it's free from contaminants such as other plants and grains and of the highest quality. As you can see at Munson's the testing is pretty rigorous and anything that doesn't meet their parameters is rejected there and then. From there it's put into silos where it waits its turn to be germinated. Barley is full of starch which is basically sugar in a form that yeasts can't ferment so we germinate it to make it easier for them. The grain is steeped in tepid water to hydrate the starch and activate the enzymes, the perfect state to sprout shoots and grow. They are left to germinate on giant humidified warehouse floors where tough starches break down into powdery mill that will turn into sugar during the brewing. Before that can truly start to grow though, the grain is kilned to stop the process and dry it out. Ready? Yeah. It's when we get kilning that malt gets exciting. As well as preserving the enzymes and sugar for the mash, maltsters can add colour and flavour in the kiln. Lower temperatures and less time in the kiln means lighter roasting and more biscuit and caramel notes, while higher temperatures and longer time will result in carbonisation of the sugars and more savoury, roast-based flavours. In fact, there is a veritable, if very brown, rainbow of malts. Extra pale malts are like Jacob's Crackers, brilliant with vibrant citrus hops. Munich malt is like a digestive biscuit that needs a slap of noble hot bitterness. Cara and amber malts with their toffee and nuttiness love a soft, juicy English ale yeast, while chocolate malt with its dark cocoa and black malt with its burnt toast aroma add balance to big and boozy imperial stouts. These more specialist malts are made at the historic small batch drum maltings at Munson's.
And then when it comes to the flavour generation, um, I guess the main way that it's done is through the level of kilning. Yes, exactly. So kilning, depending on what kind of temperatures we run at and what kind of moisture is in the grain while we hit it with that temperature will move us from a green flavour that's like raw barley going through a slight biscuit char to a very malty, aily flavour and then caramel and down the line to sort of chocolate, roasted, coffee kind of flavours. And there's kind of, there's, there's speciality malt as well which can have like, like crystal malt, a real like real caramel, not just a little hint of it. Yes. How's that created? So for caramel malts, uh, they're made in um, drum roasters. We would have to hit um, the green barley, so undried, fresh off the germination box. We'd hit it with a uh, mashing temperature, so similar to brewing, sort of around the 55 to 65 degree mark to start converting sugars, uh, starches to sugars and then we will then rapidly increase the temperature and start drying this down and caramelizing the sugar inside the grain and then depending on what kind of uh, what malt, crystal malt it will be you'd go from a very light color sort of 10 to 15 EBC to all the way up to 400 EBC where you've just got different forms of caramelized sugar in it. Clearly a lot of work in history has gone into producing different kinds of malts and that demand is now being driven further by brewers as they look to diversify and improve upon what they make. Of course, there is still a lot of work to do once the malting is done. The mash is a critical and intensely complicated part of the brewing process, with endless opportunity to tweak to get the best from an ingredient that varies throughout the year. In small breweries it's the time when brewers are using their instincts as much as their brains, and in bigger breweries it's calculated and monitored to the nth degree. The idea is to extract the malt sugars by warming the malt to the point where its enzymes start to break down the inedible starch. But in reality, it's a tricky balancing act between the right amount of water, the right temperature and the right time. In the end you need the desired colour as well as the perfect gravity to nail the balance of sweetness and the alcohol level. One of the breweries that takes the most exciting and innovative approaches to their mashing is Burnt Mill, probably because their brewer Sophie used to do Fabian's job at Muntins. After our maltings tour we headed over to Burnt Mill, which is conveniently located across the road. There we got chatting about how malt is used and what brewers can do to add flavour, aroma and nuance to their beers at the mashing and boiling stage. So we've travelled all of 500 metres from Muntins over to Burnt Mill. Uh, who we put in our 2018 breweries to watch out for and we have been watching and very much enjoying your beers. Um, so I'm here with Charles and with Sophie. So the beers that you make are typically mostly extremely hoppy but I've got a beer right here that is extremely not. Do you guys like playing around with more complicated grists than yeah. perhaps some breweries do? I think we, from the start, right, we were at that so, you know, when we were putting our ideas together, there's also like, yeah, it's a lot of um, cereals that people maybe don't look at um, and but for, for no good reason, uh, you know, if something adds something to a brew, then there's no reason why you shouldn't use it. You know, if it's rice or maize, um, yeah, all different types of uh, oats that we use here as well. So there's, there's no reason for us um, like to shy away from not using barley. Mm. Um, and yeah, so the, not having that kind of any sort of hang-ups and that has kind of helped us that we could, you know, use it a bunch of different things uh, that we wouldn't um, normally have gone for. But the good thing, obviously, I can, we can have an idea and then we can talk about how practical it is to add <laughs> <laughs> all that sort of thing. And Sophie could, could, yeah, can break it down and be like, oh, well, you know, if you do this, then there's going to be a knock-on effect. <laughs> well, you could do that, <laughs> but... <laughs> Shut the <jobs>, come on. <laughs> Where brewers used to stick to barley for their mash, the snobbery about other grains is gone. Wheat for body and white bread like sweetness, rye for a spicy tang, and a range of gluten free and heritage malts that give hope to poor celiacs. Even rice has made a comeback in craft brewing as Mexican style light lagers make a comeback. You know, there's lots of different techniques being used in hops and lots of different products coming out all of the time. Is that the same for you guys with malt? Are there new products or new, new processes you're bringing in that? I don't know if it's a case of new products, it's just exploring the depth and the range of products out there, um, which is vast. And you've got a whole range of uh, white malts, so your base malts, 
going from like your super pale and your pilsner types up to your munichs and your um, aromatic malts and things like that so I think there's probably going to be a bit more about exploring those different types of things mm. and trying to get different flavours and characteristics in through that way. I mean, this uh, this seems pretty revolutionary to me. I, I don't think I've ever had a beer that had zero pale or pilsner malt in. Um, have, have I just not been aware of that fact, or is this quite quite an unusual thing to brew? Um, if you think about sort of a, a classic Bavarian or Vienna lager, then they're made with Munich or Vienna malt. Purely, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I've drunk a so. fuck ton of <laughs> <laughs> And hence why they have that sort of nice burnt orange and mm. nice, nice biscuity kind of flavour. It comes from the slightly higher roasting of the those um, pale malts because yep. they've still got the enzyme activity in there but it's slightly lower than what you'd have in your pale malt. For most brewers, malt forms the baseline of a beer recipe onto which they layer everything else. Traditional British styles are all about the yeast and hop nuances that play off the malt. West Coast styles may be known for their hops, but malts are a huge part of that flavour. And in lager, it's most of the beer's depth and moorishness. Brewers are only starting to explore the wide variety of flavours that can be teased out by selection and process, slowly exploring the hard work done over centuries by maltsters. Guys, next time you pick up, whether it's a Pilsner or a Pale Ale or an IPA or a Stout or a Porter or a Barley Wine, I couldn't recommend just having a little think, not just about the hops that have been involved or the yeast that's uh, brought out those flavours, having a little think about that malt bill and what flavours might have come from it can sort of open your eyes to some, some other things that are going on in beer which maybe lots of us pass over in excitement about the things that move a little bit quicker like the different yeast strains and the different hops. Uh, so I hope this beer school has been really helpful for you. Obviously make sure you check out all our other beer schools about hops, about how to taste beer like a beer judge, um, about how sour beer is made and all other kinds of amazing barrel based things. Um, but guys, thank you very much and cheers, cheers to Mont uh, Muntins as well. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.